This is Vince Krivda. Michael Sullivan, in his full Preter's critique of Keith Matheson's partial Preter's post-millennialism, in the book House Divided, a book I recommend. It's one of my favorite books. I am very critical of it, though. Presents a common full Preterist argument against contemporary partial Preterism. It's made in many forms, and I used to make this similar argument myself. In fact, it's compelling. That is, if partial Preterists concede that the prophetic events of the Olivet Discourse, which is Matthew chapter 24 and parallels, were fulfilled around AD 70, and it can be demonstrated that 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5 teach of those very same prophetic events, then the prophetic events of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5 were fulfilled around AD 70. Seems to be simple logic. Therefore, if 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5 speak of the resurrection at the last day, which is generally held and believed, then the last day was fulfilled around AD 70. And partial preterism would that inevitably lead to full preterism. Sullivan appeals to the futurist interpretation that the prophetic events of the Olivet Discourse are the very same as in 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5. And he does this so he can argue that 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5 teach of the same prophetic events of Matthew chapter 24. Therefore, if you hold one thing as fulfilled and they're the same events spoken of, then you have to hold to full preterism, that the whole thing's fulfilled, the resurrection is past. It appeals to an invisible majority and the general assent to this futurist interpretation by citing virtually every commentator and cross-reference system parallels. Not only is it an exaggeration to argue that virtually every commentator makes this connection, but it is a mistake to think that cross-reference comparisons are intended to always show precise parallels. Indeed, sometimes they do, but we don't hold those to be inspired and inerrant. And instead of appealing to exegetical grounds, full preterists commonly present parallels by abstracting similar words in isolated passages and making undue connections. But this is not an analogy of faith. It is not the conservative method. According to Sullivan, Christ returns from heaven, and both passages, 1 Thessalonians chapters 4, verse 16, and Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. He does this with a compelling graph, which shows a list of similarities between Matthew chapter 24 and 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5. But a Matthew chapter 24 verse 30 does not depict his return from heaven, but the sign of his coming in heaven, on the clouds of heaven. This we don't, I don't hold as a bodily coming, but the sign being revealed here. According to Solomon, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 and Matthew chapter 24 verse 31, both teach of Christ's return with an angelic voice. But again, upon, upon a closer inspection, Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, mentions no voice or return, only that angels are sent. So just because there's the word angel present in some form in both texts, there's some sort of connection. He also suggests that both these verses teach of Christ's return with God's trumpet. Yet is there any solid warrant for knowing that the trumpet of God and the great sound of a trumpet refer to the same historical event. In fact, there's plenty of examples where trumpets are used as symbols in the Bible, especially apocalyptic or prophetic symbols, and they're not always speaking of the same specific historical event. And again, according to Solomon, these two verses also teach that believers were caught up to be with Christ. Yet Matthew chapter 24 verse 31 has no mention of being caught up to be with Christ specifically, only of a gathering by angels. According to Sullivan verse Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17 and Matthew chapter 24 verse 30 both teach that believers meet Christ in the clouds. Yet Matthew chapter 24 verse 30 says nothing of the sort. 
just because you see two passages that have common symbolic words, cloud or trumpet, in a passage does not give sufficient warrant to infer that they are teaching of the same exact events, except for when there is enough contextual and exegetical evidence. But here we're seeing not so much exegetical evidence, but seeing certain symbolic words or key phrases. Sullivan goes on to make connections between 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 to 8 and Matthew chapter 24 verses 8 to 49. Sullivan argues also that it is inconsistent to make parallels between Matthew chapter 24 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, but then deny any parallels between chapter 24 of Matthew and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is what he critiques Matheson of doing. Yet the article, but, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, could possibly be used as an adversative. And if so, it would entirely make sense that Paul speaks of still future things in chapter 4, but eminent things in chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Sullivan also uses the same method in comparing Matthew chapter 16, verse 27 to 28, and even Romans chapter 8 with the Olivet Discourse. As if Christ coming into his glory means exactly the same as every coming with glory. In Preterist realism, Christ coming into his glory and to the Father's glory is specifically attributed and associated with his enthronement at the Ascension. Therefore, we don't confuse it with his glorious return. Sullivan suggests that Christ coming into the glory of his Father with angels means exactly the same thing as Christ sending his angels. And that Christ coming with rewards means the exact same thing as coming in judgment. It may appear that the full preterist demonstrates a plethora of similarities between 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in the Olivet Discourse that cannot be dismissed as merely coincidental details. But just as many contradictory differences between the texts may also be raised and different themes showing that they have different central themes. In conclusion, Sullivan's assertions are not clearly demonstrated by his hermeneutic, and the future's presuppositions are therefore debatable, on the table for discussion, not settled by a decisive graph made by Sullivan.